Good morning. Well, happy Father's Day. All of you who are fathers, would you please stand? And you have to stand through the whole service. You cannot sit down. This is a test. We're going to see how faithful you are. Yeah, and I do stand through most of the service. It's, so I'm not going to make them do it. And I hope all of you have an absolutely incredibly wonderful Father's Day. The flowers are given in memory and honor of all our fathers. And the CPWM, the Women's Ministry, has made a donation to Heifer International in honor and recognition of fathers on their special day. Reminder, we make match for the homeless on Monday at 3 o'clock, and we have intercessory prayer Wednesday at 11. Carlton and Margaret, I separated them. It's Carlton and Margaret are celebrating their anniversary this Friday. So congratulations. And in honor of that, we're making him work. Now, actually, he's leading the singing because Ace is spending his very first Father's Day with his family. He is taking the day off. He asked if that was appropriate, and I said, no, I'm sorry, that's just... <laughs> well, of course it is. Oh, just a reminder, uh, I'm going to lead a class on what we believe beginning July the 11th, back in the fellowship hall during the Sunday school time. Invite anybody who'd like to talk about, discuss what we believe to join us then. During the prelude, we're going to have a special slide presentation on Sunday, Funday, which was last Sunday. And you'll be able, after the... Uh, Acolyte, after the bringing in of the light, then we will have that presentation. Oh, and Barbara is going to play the Lord's Prayer because that was the theme for Sunday Fun Day. Are there any other announcements that need to be made? Catherine? And we're excited that you are here. She had knee replacement surgery, for those of you who don't know. Any other announcements? If not, then let us worship God.
You, Lord, are our Father. We are the clay. You are the potter. We are all the work of your hand. Oh, look on us, we pray, for we are all your people. Let us pray. Almighty God, we come humbly into the potter's house. You have made us who we are, but we know that you're not finished with us yet. You're the potter and we are the clay. Mold us and make us after your will. While we're waiting, yield it and still. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together if you're able and let's sing together in the hymn number 40, This Is My Father's World. be seated while the children come forward for their special time. <laughs> Good morning. You doing okay? Do you enjoy Sunday fun day? That looks so cool. That looked like it was so much fun. Now today is a very special day. Because, and you know what today is because we've already talked about it, but it's Father's Day, right? Yeah. yeah. There are a lot of different meanings to the name Father's Day. Do you know there are biological fathers? And I am a biological fathers. Then there are step fathers. And probably the most famous stepfather was Joseph, who was the stepfather of Jesus. Now, Jesus' mother was Mary, but stepfather was Joseph and taught him probably a lot of things. But the thing we believe he did was to teach him a profession. See, Joseph was a carpenter, and we believe that he taught Jesus how to be a carpenter. Tradition has it that Jesus took over the carpenter's shop when his father died, which is one of the reasons he was 30 years of age before he started his ministry. But then there are other people in our lives who are like a father to us. They're not biologically our father. They're not a stepfather. And in the Bible, there is Paul and Timothy. And Paul was like a father to Timothy. He would encourage him. 
He would help him. He wrote letters to him. He told him, now remember, you're not too young to be a pastor. You can do this. And, oh, in the Old Testament, there is Eli. He was a priest, and he was like a father to young Samuel. And taught him something very special. I'm sure he taught him a lot of things. But one was how to listen for God's voice, how to recognize God's voice, which is a wonderful thing for all of us to know. But there is another type of father, and that is an adoptive father. And I'm one of those too. I have two adopted children. But do you know that you're adopted? God, our Father, has adopted each one of us. We all have different fathers, but then we all have the same Father. And in Romans 8, 14 through 17, this is what Paul says, for those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The Spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear. Rather, the Spirit you receive brought about your adoption. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. Abba means, you know what Abba means? Daddy. Daddy, which is what my youngest daughter calls me still to this day. She calls me Daddy. The other kids call me Dad, but she calls me Daddy. That means it's very personal. And he loves us in a very special way. Now God, our Heavenly Father, is a perfect Father. And unfortunately, I'm human and I'm not perfect and no other father is but we love you and God loves you unconditionally and that's what I want you to remember today yeah we have there are lots of different types of fathers but we all have the same father and that is God so let us stand let me get you to stand and I'll get you to pray with me okay Well, I guess we can actually hold hands now, can't we? Okay. Let's get in a circle. This way we used to do it for those of you who are new and the pandemic kind of threw things out of kilter. So let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for biological fathers, for stepfathers, for people who are like a father to us. But most of all, we thank you that you are our heavenly father. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for being here. going to sing hymn number 119 verses 1, 2, and 4. They'll know we are Christians by our love. Stand with me, please.
His master replied, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Let us worship now with the giving of our gifts to God. Gracious God, our greatest desire is to hear you say, well done, good and faithful servant. We pray that everything we do brings glory to you. And what we place before you now is pleasing in your sight. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. You may be seated. Our scripture this morning is taken from the fifth chapter of Paul's letter to the Ephesians, and I'll read the first two verses and then verses 15 through 20. So I invite you to listen. Listen for the word of God to you. Follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children, and walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, seeing and make music from your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Friends, this is the Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. And let us once again go to God in prayer, and I will remind you of the prayer concerns printed on the back of the bulletin. Uh, I will mention a couple that you don't have. And again, we're grateful that Catherine is able to be back in worship with us, but continue to pray for her recovery. Because even though she's here, there's probably still a little ways she needs to go. I got an email from Pat Garula saying he is going to have a bone marrow biopsy on Tuesday. 
So we ask that you lift him up and pray for him. And he also asks that we pray for Abby, uh, who has been sick this week. And I found out that Ed and Amy Butcher have a brand new grandson, Knox, who was born on June the 17th. So congratulations to, to them, uh, born to Chris and Ellie. If there's anyone that you would like to let us know about, you're invited to say their name out loud as we first go to God silently in prayer, and then I will lead in the pastoral prayer. Loving God, on this Father's Day, we do thank you for being our Heavenly Father. You are a a loving parent who cares for us. You are always with us, walking before us to guide us, behind us to encourage us, and carrying us whenever the load is too great for us to bear alone. Our prayer is one of gratitude. We're grateful for parents who loved us and for the sacrifices they made for us. Our prayer is one of petition for the gifts we need as we seek to be good parents and grandparents, for patience, for cheerfulness, for the ability to know what's important and what really isn't. Our prayer is one of intercession for little children who don't get a parent's love, for homes weakened and about to fall. Our prayer is one of confession. We live in a world with others and conflict comes, and, and we confess that something ugly inside us too often gains control. And we say words that wound and hurt. We confess that sometimes we're just too sensitive, and we find offense when none was intended. Let Christ so live in our hearts and homes that the love he died to display takes root and blooms into peace. For it is in his holy name that we offer this prayer and ask that you hear us now as we pray the prayer he taught us to pray, saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Jim Blanchard is a very effective leader who leads a weekly meeting at this local bank and he shares his thought for those individuals in this meeting, the people he works with and the people who work for him. And one of the things he does, he emphasizes their priorities and he tells them what he thinks their priorities should be. And he says, your faith your family, and your job. Then he goes on to say, and it needs to be in that order. Because if you get them out of order, pretty soon you're going to have so many personal problems, you will be absolutely of no use to us at work at all. So how about you? Do you have your priorities in order? On a scale of 1 to 10, how well are you doing with your faith, with your family? Then your job or whatever it is that you are dealing with during the week? Are you fulfilling the promises you made to God and to your family? Today, because it is Father's Day, I want to talk about strengthening our families and what it'll take to have the right priorities to fulfill those promises. 
And I'll mention three things. And the first one is to care more. Do you know what our greatest fear is, according to psychologists? The greatest fear we have is rejection. Then what do they say is our greatest need? Our greatest need is acceptance. So what do we need more than anything else in our homes, in our families, in our relationships, to care more, to make sure they know that they are loved and appreciated and accepted. The one thing we do not ever want to do is to reject them or to make them feel like they're of no value to us whatsoever. So to improve our homes, we need to strengthen that caring. How do we do that? Let me give you one image that I really like from Stephen Covey's book, Seven Habits of Highly Effective Families, where he talks about the emotional bank account. Do you remember me mentioning this to you before? Now he says, we all have an emotional bank account, and it's very much like a financial bank account. And with your financial bank account, you have to make more deposits than withdrawals, or what happens? You're overdrawn. And if you keep being overdrawn day after day after day, the penalty for that can be pretty large. You can owe them a lot of money. And if you continue to do that, continue to be overdrawn, what are they going to do? Close out your account. It says in the same way, we all have an emotional bank account. You need to make more deposit into your relational emotional bank account than you do withdrawals. Okay, what, how do you make deposits? Now, hopefully you all know this. Every time you affirm them, every time you do something that they appreciate, every time you express your love, care, and concern for them, you make a deposit. Every time you hurt them, every time you demean them, every time you nag them, every time you put them down, you're making a withdrawal. And if you continue to withdraw day after day after day, the penalty can be tremendous. And one day, one day your account could be closed out completely. We need to pay attention to how we relate to one another in all our relationships, but especially in the one we say is most important in the family with your spouse, with your kids, with your grandkids. Now, some deposits are bigger than others, and some withdrawals are bigger than others. When I went through my surgery, my kids, Deanne being there with me for the surgery, especially because she's a nurse, for the surgery and then right after was a huge deposit into the emotional bank account. She had to take off work to do that. And my son coming up when Deanne left to be with me for the next few days was a huge emotional deposit. When you express, just like Catherine was saying, expressing her appreciation, when you express your appreciation to me with your cards, with your food, with your calls, with your prayers, that was a huge deposit in my emotional bank account. Every time you tell me I have a good sermon, Kay's really good about making deposit into my emotional bank account, I just walk out of here feeling great. See, she'll say that even if the sermon is terrible. So this is why I love Kay so much. She's a very special person. Now, <laughs> that was very, well, anyway. there. <laughs> now, you know how to make withdrawals, don't you? It is a lot easier to make withdrawals from the emotional bank account than I think it is to make deposits because you're always going to find those things you don't like about the other person. And as I said, some withdrawals are a lot bigger than others. For instance, there are some that are non-negotiable, like an affair is a withdrawal from which most marriages do not recover. But pay attention to the withdrawals. If you constantly harp on the three things you don't like about your spouse, about your kids, about your grandkids, instead of affirming the 100 things you love about them, like about them, appreciate about them, you could bury your relationship one dig at a time. And it's amazing how many people do not understand this. They think they can keep nagging and putting down and talking about what they don't like, and it's going to change it for the better. Never happens. Never. And we're not supposed to use absolutes. But I guarantee you, 
It never works. You can win the battle. I guarantee you, you will lose the war because pretty soon you're going to be overdrawn to the point that the whole account is going to be withdrawn. It's going to be taken away. So pay attention to what you're doing. Remember what Paul said in those first two verses. Follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children. And do what? Walk in the way of love. How can you express if you have concerns? And you will. We all do. How do you express those concerns in a loving, positive, caring way? Not in a hurtful, mean way. Not something that dishonors or disrespects. How can you communicate what you're trying to say without hurting your spouse, your kids, your grandkids? So walk in the way of love just as Christ loved up and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. One of the things we knew to need to do to build our homes is to take out the trash. What would happen in your house if you never took out the trash? It would look like my kids' rooms when they were adolescents. Did any of y'all have this trouble with your kids? Okay, good. I'm not the only one. Crystal is the only other one that has crazy kids. <clears throat> there were times when I would walk in their room, <clears throat> and it was like somebody had thrown a grenade in there. <laughs> Stuff was everywhere. But I would go, and you're not supposed to do this. You're supposed to make them clean it up themselves. But I'd go in and try to clean it up. Okay, that's when a mask would really be good. I wouldn't mind wearing I would find food under the bed. There would be McDonald's fries. There would be a half-eaten bowl of something over in the corner. There would be, st there's mold growing on some of that stuff. And it's, well, it doesn't, would you want to live like that? Okay, some families are emotionally living with that trash. And I'll share three things, the three passages I have up here. But before I do that, and I'm going to get Blake to put this on the screen for those who watch this on YouTube, 12 signs of a toxic relationship. If you have a majority of these in your relationship, you need professional help. And I'll probably do this as a daily devotional because that's all Patricia's trying to write it down. So I'll, I'll probably do this this week sometime. You're going to hit one, two, or three of these, probably, occasionally. But if you hit a majority of them, you have a problem. Displays of excessive anger, physical abuse should never happen, ever, never be tolerated. Cruel or cynical remarks, not when you're trying to be clever or funny, but when you are being cruel, when it's intended to hurt, stick a knife in somebody. Petty jealousy, the silent treatment, withdrawal of affection, and obviously that does happen in all relationships at times, so don't panic over that one. But if there is no affection, you need to do something. Uh, something is wrong in the relationship. Financial irresponsibility. And I want to put, you know, chronic financial irresponsibility. Lack of freedom to make decisions. If there is one person who has to make all the decisions and it's their way or the highway, there is something wrong in that relationship. Sexual immorality. Addictive disorders. Emotional exhaustion, relational isolation. And there can be people who could be married for 50 years, but they haven't had a relationship in 45. Uh, they are just kind of living in the same house, but they are really in relational isolation. What does the scripture say to get rid of? In Ephesians, get rid of all bitterness, this trash, all of these, this trash, rage and anger. And that's going to come out in about two or three different places, brawling and slander along with every form of malice. Then in 1 Corinthians 13, the love chapter, he tells us what love is, what love isn't. So what is <clears throat> trash? Impatience, not being kind, envying, boasting, being filled with pride, dishonoring others, being self-centered, getting easily, and this is, I like, this part, easily angered. Anger in itself is not a sin. What you do with the anger can be. But being easily angered where everything sets you off, something is wrong. 
It keeps no record of wrongs. If you cannot forgive, unforgiveness is a sin. Not being able to do that, and it hurts you more than the other person, and it hurts the other person. In Galatian, he puts it this way, uh, sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions. I think we need to send this to Congress. Just kind of, have you read this? By the way, so just in case you've never heard this, just what this is trash things that we need to take out. We need to remodel our relationships to make our home a place that is much more positive and affirming and caring and a place where love can, in fact, grow. Now, it's interesting. I've read this. One person put it. Marriages start out as an ideal. Then it becomes an ordeal. <laughs> then they begin looking for a new deal. Okay, that's not how it's supposed to work. They also said most people discover that a marriage license is really a learner's permit. <laughs> it's on the job training, isn't it? Now, it is like any profession, mine. I mean, I went to three years of seminary. Well, they can't teach you everything you need to know about being a pastor. Some things you just, well, then I went on and got even more education, which who knows. But anyway, you can't know everything, but you need to know something. If you have to take a test to get a driver's license, why shouldn't you have to take a test if you're mature enough to actually get married? Now, you can be old enough. You could be my age and not be mature enough to get married. I believe in premarital counseling. If you go to a good counselor, it can help you tremendously to enable you to work through all the rough spots that you're going to have, to be able to recognize the red flags when they first come up so they don't become a huge problem in the relationship. Now, let me emphasize, I believe in good premarital counseling. There is some premarital counseling is probably a waste of time, and you just don't need to put up with it, but good premarital counseling can help, and it'll establish a relationship that you can go to when those problems occur, and you can't solve all of those problems by yourself. You will need help. And if you've already established a relationship with somebody you trust, it's much easier to talk them out and to work through them. And I think that is something we kind of ignore. If you're old enough, it's kind of like, I guess, throwing you in the car without trying to teach you how to drive. And many people have a wreck. They just kind of destroy each other's lives. Now, Oh, I love this quote by Ben Franklin. If you fail to plan, you're planning to fail. And there are a lot of different adaptations to that that leadership people will use. But there are a lot of people who get married and they plan on their marriage failing because they have no plan. They think, well, we love each other, so if we love each other, everything is going to be fine. Everything will just work out. That's not how it works. I mean, we have to have a strategic plan for everything now, don't we? We do it. Well, I know you do in the school system. I know we do at seminary. I know you do in business. Why don't we do a strategic plan for relationships? Where do you want to be three to five years from now? Okay, now tell me, how are you going to get there? What are the steps? And it has to be specific, attainable, measurable. A lot of people say, well, we just want to grow closer together. We just want to be happy. Great but that's not specific. How are you going to do that? We'll spend more time together. Still too general. How are you going to do that? We'll have a date night once a week. We'll have a family night every Saturday. We'll go to church together every Sunday. Just thought of that one. That one, put that down right now. <laughs> to make a strong, go to church every Sunday. Okay, you get the point. If you're going, if, if you have a goal in mind and you need a goal, then how are you going to accomplish that? What are you going to do to enable that to happen so love can, so you don't just survive in a relationship, you begin to thrive in that relationship. 
And I'm trying to find, okay, we need to cooperate. <laughs> I got lost in my own outline. We need to, well, maybe I, maybe I need to go back to seminary. I don't, I don't know. Oh, please no. Okay, from we need to move from a house to a home. Now, a house is where you live, right? A home is where life happens. And I believe it is absolutely the bottom line. Let me share a quote with you from Chuck Swindoll. He says, whatever else may be said about home, it's the bottom line of life. The anvil upon which attitudes and convictions are hammered out. It's the place where life's bills come due. The single most influential force in our earthly existence. No price tag can adequately reflect its value. No gauge can measure its influence for good or ill. It's home among family members that we come to terms with circumstances. It's here that life makes up its mind. And I love that because now I was blessed with a wonderful home, with wonderful parents, and, and very loving, very caring. I felt very accepted and loved and appreciated. And okay, I'll throw this in really quickly. It just popped in my mind. I'm going to have a funeral service for my brother uh, this Thursday. But one of the things that I've shared with you before. You feel loved and appreciated for who you are, no matter what you're doing. During the Vietnam War, and I was in Vietnam, I was in the Marine Corps. Well, my brother was a conscientious objector, and he was picketing the war. He was protesting the war while I was in the war. And when I got back, Mark asked me, did it bother you that I was protesting the war while you were there? And I went... No, and it really didn't. I mean, one of the things you fight for is your ability to express your opinion. I want you to be able to express your opinion. But the beauty of this for me, well, his concern, I appreciated that, but my love for him wasn't based on whether he thought it was a good idea for me to be in the war. But my parents supported both of us. That was the important bottom line they loved us both. Did they agree completely with both of us? No. But did they love us completely? Absolutely. When I came back, they felt, I felt very loved and accepted. My brother, Mark, always felt loved and accepted. And somehow we have to be able to get to that point. Now, and it is the bottom line. One of the difficult things in relationships today, in the family... Almost all families now, both parents have to work to make ends meet. And so we do get distracted. It's hard to spend the amount of time that we need to spend with our children. But what really disturbs me about relationships is what I see on television. Uh, Twitter, social media, a lot of reality shows, the things that I see, they show you what not to do. But people think it's appropriate to do those things, which is why I threw those three passages of Scripture up there. So you know the anger and yelling and getting mad. This is not appropriate behavior. This is not how you're supposed to work through your problems, work through the things that are disturbing you in that relationship. So there are a lot of challenges. But do you bend or do you break? It's important to be flexible. And I do believe that a lot of marriages, a lot of families are hurt and disturbed and broken because of inflexibility, not being able to bend. Ephesians 5.21 and then 1 Corinthians 13.13, 13, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. And I'm going to throw this in where this is the beginning of a section on marriage and how husbands and wives should relate. And where it usually starts is with verse 22. And some of you have heard me share this before, so this is just kind of review. But remember, verse 22 says, Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. And men will hear this and go, Oh boy, that sounds wonderful. 
That means I get to be God in the relationship. That's not what Paul is saying. Paul is saying you get to be Jesus in the relationship. And I would much rather be God, the Father, than Jesus, the crucified Son. They ignore that verse. They ignore verse 21, where he says, submit to one another. Then he gives two examples. Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. Husbands, love your wives. How has Christ loved the church? What kind of love was that? Was it a demanding, dictatorial kind of love? A love that said, when I say jump, you say how high? No, sacrificial. A love that gave everything it had on a hill called Mount Calvary. It is sacrificial, self-giving. And if more husbands and wives had that kind of love for each other, where they're trying to submit to one another, where they're trying to put the other person's needs, wants, wishes, and desires above their own, and they both have to do that for that to work, then your marriage will be incredibly beautiful and incredibly wonderful. But if only one person is doing it, then it's really out of balance. But that's the point Paul is making. And we do need to learn how to be able to bend and not to break. And then, oh yeah, 1 Corinthians 13. Now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Everything. Everything should be born out of love and care and concern. Not anger, hatred, bitterness, resentment, trying to put the other person down because you're mad at them. And then to commit more be careful and remember what Paul says. Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise. Making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. There are so many things out there that is going to seek to destroy your relationship. So many things that will come in. So many things within that will try to come out. So make the most of every opportunity. Do not fall asleep at the wheel. I think distracted driving probably causes more accidents than anything else. And we can be distracted by so many other things in life. So what are your priorities? What do you want to see happen in your relationships, in your family? Where do you want to be three to five years from now? Now tell me, how are you going to get there? Let us pray. Loving God, we come to you grateful for the gift of, of relationships, of families, of individuals that we can go to and just be ourselves, where we don't have to pretend to be something or someone we're not. We pray now for discernment, for wisdom, to know how to truly strengthen our homes so we're not just surviving, but truly thriving and becoming the husband, the wife, the mother, the father, the grandmother, the grandfather that you want us to be. Show us the way. Give us the strength to follow. This is our prayer. Lifted through Jesus the Christ. Amen. I'm going to invite you now to affirm your faith with me uh, by reading in unison John 15, 9 through 14. So would you stand as we affirm our faith together? As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love. Just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command.
invitation to you as you go through this week to think about, to keep in mind your emotional bank account and the emotional bank account of the people in your life. What kind of deposits are you making? Are you making more positive? Are you making more positive deposits? Or are you making withdrawals? Just think about that in your relationships. I also extend the invitation if there's anyone here who has not surrendered their life to Christ. And if you have felt the movement of God's Spirit, if you would like to do that publicly, and you can do it privately, and I'd love to talk to you. But if you'd like to do it publicly, you may do that as we sing verses 1, 3, and 4 of hymn number 118. Now may God's love give you confidence and his truth give you direction. May God's eternalness give you peace and hope this day and all your days. Amen. Amen.